the Shingai George for such an insightful presentation, uh, executed so wonderfully. Uh, this is uh, aviation and IT expert, Mr. Shingai George, from Insights Experts and Market Data, uh, who is actually uh, an Insights Expert and Market Data Analyst from Forward Keys, Spain, uh, breaking down the state of play of intra-Africa connectivity and opportunity for accelerating intra-Africa travel. And yes, he says, if there are any more questions, please engage with him on his LinkedIn. As we move swiftly along to the next panel discussion, uh, now this is another hard talk one on intra Africa travel and tourism revolution. Uh, basically now uh, delving into revolutionizing intra-Africa travel through a purposeful Pan-African apex private sector body, an absolute prerequisite for improving connectivity in Africa. Now to moderate this next session, I'd like to invite the director of BDO South Africa, uh, Ms. Leanne back. Please make it to the stage and uh, do enjoy your session. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to call my esteemed panel to join me on the stage, please, um, as we talk about intra-Africa travel, um, which very much links Nick into the presentation that we just had. It's about creating connectivity across Africa to drive travel by Africans within Africa. So, Ms. Winnie Muchanyuka, the CEO of Zimbabwe Tourism Authority, will you join us on the stage, please? Linda Motesi from Tourism Promotions Manager at the Rwanda Development Board. Will you join us on stage, please? Monica Uel, the Chief Destination Marketing Officer at Westgrow. And then finally, our thorn amongst the roses, or should we say our rose amongst the thorns? Pardon? The Y chromosome, yes. Dr. Bio. Mosini, from who is the CEO of the Civil Aviation Authority of Botswana, will you join us? Thank you very much. Thank you, panelists. So before I pose questions to our panel, I'd just like to bring all of you up to speed who were not in the, the closed session that we had yesterday, where we actually discussed the formation of a pan-African private sector tourism alliance, if you want to call it, so it's, as I mentioned, private sector initiative. Um, and Kwach, Mr. Donkor mentioned it this morning in terms of this is the way we were going to move in terms of driving some of the connectivity that's needed across Africa. And yesterday we discussed the fact that there's proven research that shows that tourism becomes before trade. Tourism drives trade, which drives economic investment. So tourism is an underpinning requirement for economic activity in Africa. And we need to work together to create and to generate more travel across Africa. And it was decided that we needed to establish this pan-African private sector body um, because we cannot wait to, um, for public sector to get to, to organize something like this. And we do believe that the tourism sector is private sector driven and therefore it is important for the private sector to take this forward. And the, the key challenges that this private sector body would need to work on is about connecting countries together. But it was recognized that air access, visa access are very big challenges to chew. Um, and, but that shouldn't stop this alliance from actually forming. So the initial focus was agreed it will be on marketing. How do we get Africans to travel within Africa? How do we package and how do we market Africa to Africans? So today our panelists are most more public sector representatives. So it will be interesting to hear from them in terms of how the, they see the role of this pan-African private sector initiative in driving tourism in, from an intra-Africa perspective. And I'm going to ask each of them, one by one, to introduce themselves. 
their role that they play, or their, their organization plays, in driving tourism um, in their region or in Africa. And then I was going to ask them to ask to, to tell us how they see the role of this private sector entity in driving tourism in Africa. And Leanne, I'd like to quickly, just quickly for a few seconds, just interrupt uh, before the introductions to just encourage our audience both here uh, with us physically as well as those virtually to engage via the www.slido.com app because that is where we're going to be taking questions for this particular session. So please send your questions through to that very interactive platform. Your questions or comments, please share them there. Thank you. You may continue, Leanne. Okay, I'm going to start with Monica because you're sitting here. Okay, you can use this one. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Leanne. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Ewell. I'm the Chief Destination Marketing Officer at Westgrow. And Westgrow is the official tourism, trade, and investment promotion agency for the Western Cape province in South Africa. Um, our role really is to attract as much visitation inside the province, as much economic activity within the province, and most importantly, create as much employment as possible within the province out of tourism. I look after both the leisure tourism sector as well as the business events side, so the convention bureau, um, as well as the leisure tourism uh, effort, as well as lastly, Cruise Cape Town also falls within the DMO at Westgrow. The point that I really want to make in terms of the value of, a, of an organized private sector on the continent was really a learning that we had coming through the pandemic, which is that government is actually pretty disorganized when it comes to leading in terms of policy. And oftentimes it is incumbent on the private sector to actually do the leading, particularly in those sorts of spaces. The, the challenge that we've got at the moment, and we saw it at the TBCSA leadership conference that we were in in Sun City only last month, a lot of the barriers to growth in the tourism sector actually don't sit within our mandate. I was very happy to see the Botswana Minister of Transport here this morning. Um, we, unfortunately, in South Africa, for example, never get an audience with our transport minister in a tourism context. We have to fight really hard to be heard in that space. So I think having a private sector body that the entire government can engage with, but that also gives itself permission to lead beyond its mandate, to remove those barriers that don't necessarily sit directly within the tourism ecosystem is absolutely key. Hello everyone, um, my name is Linda Mutesi and I'm in charge of tourism promotion at the Rwanda Development Board. Uh, the Rwanda Development Board is a public institution that um, is, was, is, was created to actually um, drive uh, private sector investments uh, by enabling, of course, private sector. So uh, one of the um, things that we do at the Rwanda Development Board, apart from you know, investment attraction, and uh, export promotion. We also uh, do tourism and conservation, um, tourism and conservation. And our role uh, for tourism and conservation is to ov obviously attract as many visitors into the destination, um, mostly focused on leisure and mice, and uh, also to develop product, uh, maintain the product, improve experiences, as well as uh, manage uh, the national parks within uh, the country. We have four national parks. Um, we've grown from you know, just two national parks to four national parks in the last uh, few years. So it's, um, it's been a journey for us. It's a, a young destination uh, compared to most of Africa, and we've seen a lot of growth. Um, perhaps my contribution to um, you know, the topic that we are um, discussing today, uh, the role of the private sector body or the alliance that, um, you know, was proposed yesterday is um, basically I, I feel like government and, public and private sector need to work together to make things happen. We've had um, several, we, we, we all know we have several regional bodies from, you know, with the different uh, regional blocks. And so what our experience has been in East Africa is, um, you know, back then uh, we, we had what we called the Northern Corridor Initiative. 
and this was driven by uh, the East African Tourism Platform, which was, which was specifically a, a private sector body. But what they did different was to engage government. And government sat on the table with uh, private sector. And, uh, you know, you need your policymakers to be on the table with you if you want to drive something. And so um, things worked. We now have uh, an East African tourist visa. Uh, if you want to travel to Rwanda, uh, Uganda, Kenya, there is one common visa that we have. And you can spend as many as 90 days uh, within the block. Um, for East Africans, if I want to travel to Kenya, for instance, I don't even need a passport. I just need my ID, and that works. Similarly for other partner states, uh, Kenya and Uganda. So the role of private sector is really key, but you've got to bring government on board if you want things to work as well. Thank you. I just want to add, just want to say that's a brilliant example of interconnectivity in East Africa, and I think we can, other blocks can definitely learn from, from what you have done. So it's a starting point. Thanks for sharing. Winnie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Winnie Michanyoka, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Zimbabwe Tourism Authority. Um, the role of the Zimbabwe Tourism Authority is to market uh, and promote destination Zimbabwe, and also to... Um, manage uh, the destination itself. Um, what is easy and what is on the surface is the marketing efforts that, that we do uh, in country and, and across the borders. But what we also do behind the scenes is to um, uh, set standards for tourism operators uh, to grade uh, facilities and to register uh, designated uh, tourism facilities. So that is the work that uh, the, the Zimbabwe Tourism Authority does. In promotion, uh, we're not um, promoting only visiting uh, Zimbabwe for leisure or for business, but we are also aggressively um, marketing Zimbabwe as a prime and, and very mature um, and ready destination for investment in uh, tourism. There are a lot of opportunities that there are to, um, to invest uh, in, in tourism so that we, we grow the product, we grow the room stock and the activities um, that would uh, eventually make uh, tour tourists stay longer and spend more uh, in Zimbabwe. So that is the work that we do um, at the Zimbabwe Tourism Authority. Um, going to um, the topic under discussion, I think the apex body that has been suggested over the last uh, day or two, uh, I think is critical for tourism in, in, in Africa. I think the governments in Africa are seized with not just tourism, they're seized with a whole lot of other issues in the economy, and they're trying to get everything in the economy to work together. But it is the tourism operators that know what is working and what is not working for them. Um, as public sector, we might sit there and come up with policy, uh, with legislation and all that, but it's actually the opera operationalization of such um, that would be identified by the operators themselves that will say whether this works for us or it doesn't work for us, or what are the gaps in between. So for tourism to really work, not just in country, but across borders and on the continent, we do need uh, a private sector to come to the table and sit with government and say what works and what doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you, Winning. Good afternoon. My name is Bao Musingi, and I'm the CEO of Civil Aviation Authority of Botswana. Uh, our job as the Civil Aviation Authority is basically two-faced. I wear two hats. Uh, first of all, I am a regulator. What we do is we ensure that uh, the safety and the security as you go over our skies or fly into our airports. So our first uh, responsibility or a, a part of us is a regulator. The second part or the second hat that we wear is a service provider. That is, we r run, operate the airports, and we also uh, operate the skies. That is to say, all the, the navigation for the uh, flights within the country or overflying the country uh, is our responsibility. So CAB, uh, at two organizations in one, we are uh, a regulator and we are also a service provider. The question about uh, our contribution to, uh, 
to tourism. Uh, as all of you know, when you talk about tourism, you always talk about, talk about travel and tourism, as opposed to just tourism. And uh, when we look uh, in our continent and we look at the infrastructure uh, and the different available modes of transport, you look at rail, uh, the passenger rail network in this continent is almost non-existent. You look at roads, our roads within our countries, and in, and in fact connecting our countries, the networks are very poor. So uh, aviation then becomes the more effective solution to transport and move uh, tourists from one place to the other. That is uh, really, for as a, an authority or aviation, that is the contribution that we make or we have to, the, uh, to tourism. We are central to what you do. Uh, we are probably one of the most important, uh, uh, if not the, the most important aspect of your business as tourism people. Uh, now to the, to the question that got asked about the, the, the apex body. Uh, I would answer it by taking into account what, what was discussed several times yesterday and by a few people today, including the speaker who just uh, uh, talked before our panel, our panel went up to the floor. The biggest problem with, with travel in Africa is really restricted choice, as the gentleman so well put it out, and high fares. In 1999, uh, the leaders of our countries got together and came up with a noble idea, which is supposed to be the holy grail that would unlock everything. And that was the Yomasokra decision. 19 years later, in 2018, we had done nothing. Almost zero. And then under the auspices of the OU, AU, we came together, our leaders came together, and came up with what has been uh, discussed several times here today, SATA, the Single Africa Air Transport Market. That is supposed to be uh, the body to use or the mechanism for implementing, implementing the Yamasokra decision. As I speak to you today, today, only 35 of our countries have signed SATAM. SATAM has several steps that each country had to take. The first step was signing the solemn commitment. And only 35 countries have signed the solemn commitment. We all agree, and all of you here agree, that that is the right thing to do. That is what's going to unlock connectivity in Africa. But our countries are still not doing it. But they agreed. That is a good idea. Now, as I look at you, if I were to pose a question, how many of you know if their country has signed the solemn commitment or not? A good number of you would not know. And there lies the problem. That is perhaps where a private sector-driven community can come in and be able to know, be updated on these things, and help plead, work with the, with the states to make sure that we move forward. Because unlike me, as, the, as, the, as the, the authority, I go to government every time. There are piles and piles of, government, of, of correspondence to government. And I talk to my colleagues all around Africa about the steps that we are taking. And a lot of things get stuck at government level. So we need help from outside. You are interested in service. But unlike you, you are also driven by, although you may, some of you may not want to admit it, by profit. You want to maximize profit and increase shareholder value. So you would really push and make sure that this gets done. So this is where uh, I believe the, the, the apex body can really play, uh, play a, a big role. After you signed the solemn commitment, there were seven so-called concrete measures that needed to be done by every country. Most of the countries have done nothing, zero. Even uh, my country, as you sit here in Botswana, we are very much for liberalization. And we are open, as open as, as one can be, whether it's capacity, frequency, fares, no restrictions. But we have not followed through with all that we needed to do in September. If I asked us, 35 of, of our countries have signed certain. But th these concrete measures, we have done nothing. One of the, 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 these concrete measures, the third one, was the creation of a national implementation committee, which would, cover, which would have representative from all stakeholders, including mostly you in the tourism industry. And if I were to ask you, does anybody know anything about a national implementation committee for certain? Most of you would not know. And that just shows that we are not moving ahead. And this 
is what we need to do to move ahead as Africa. And this, I believe, is what the EPICS body can help with. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bao. Uh, you know, yesterday, one of the speakers actually said, they said Yamasukra died, and they're predicting that Saturn is going to die too. So, but how realistically, and I mean, I don't know if any of you have got any experience in working with the private sector, dealing with the public sector, how can the private, that private sector apex body actually interact with the public sector entities to make change? And Monica, from a, from a connectivity point of view, from an airline connectivity, you've got some experience at Westgro. Yes, that's right. So, um, Westgro is the home for Cape Town Air Access, which is a public-private partnership. Um, we have um, interested parties that collaborate from um, the AXA, from the airport, Westgro ourselves, Cape Town Tourism, um, the city of Cape Town. Um, there's a whole number of DHL is involved because obviously it's not only the front of the plane but the belly of the plane that's of interest when you have accessibility. And so this is really one of those areas where, and I think we spoke about it yesterday in the closed session as well, and Chief very succinctly said it, when you find people that have got a common goal, then you can always convene. It doesn't matter if it's public or private sector. You have the ability to convene. The, the strength of an, of an apex body, it actually empowers private, public sector to engage with it if there's a sense that it is representative. It is very difficult for public sector to engage with ABC Business or XYZ Lodge. It's much easier for us to engage with entities that have organized themselves and are representative of a certain sector of the industry. So from that vantage point, I think an Apex um, body will be more useful than not. Um, but I think that more important than anything else, we have to agree, or the private sector entities have to agree, what are those three things that you want to achieve with this Apex body? Because, and then you will find support, and then you will be able to corral the in individual associations behind this. It's understanding what is the African opportunity that is perhaps different from the South African opportunity, or not different, but how does it ladder up to the African opportunity? What are those things that we can all get behind in order to create those three big things that the Apex body can start delivering and can start engaging public sector on? Thanks, and then we go to, to I'll ask Winnie. Winnie, should this apex body then rather be a public-private sector partnership? Or maybe, why is the public sector, why do we not have an apex body from a, representing the public sector entities across Africa? Um, I, I think there's uh, representation of sorts uh, for um, public sector at continental level. That might be through the AU or SADC or ECOWAS or, or one of those groupings. Um, and I'm sure in there somewhere is a component of, of tourism. So there's some kind of um, a regional or continental representation. But I don't see this from, from a private sector uh, perspective. And like my good doctor here said that um, you need the private sector to come on board and push public sector for certain things to, 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 to happen. Um, public sector are not uh, runners of business. So whilst we might be uh, seized with putting in policy, developing uh, um, uh, master plans and things like that, the private sector is worried about how much money do I make today and how feasible is it for me to engage in a certain industry, uh, what barriers are there, uh, do they have issues of taxation, do they have issues with legislation and so on. So they are the rightful people to come to the public sector and say we have a barrier in this uh, area, please can you help us unlock it. I've come from an apex body actually. As I transitioned into the Zimbabwe Tourism Authority, I was president of the Tourism Business Council of Zimbabwe before that. And I would find that in our engagements with, with government, government would always insist that we come as an organized group. And I think when you are an organized group, you also narrow down what is critical for private sector. Because we could have a, a wish list that is from here to the end of the door. But I think there would be, like you said, three things. What are the three things that are critical? What is critical for, for industry at that time? And that is what you then push. If you have three things that are critical, you push those, you're done with them, you go to the next three. Rather than try and, and attack 15 different wants and wishes for different uh, associations within, within the industry. So being organized 
be it at country level or at regional level or continental level, will definitely be the way to go because the issues would be like that. There are country-specific issues, there are regional issues, and then there are continental issues. So they would need to be approached from, from, from that perspective. So I think that um, it is critical. Government will, will run around and they will do what they need to do, um, uh, be it uh, uh, amongst groupings like SADC and so on. But the apex body needs to come and push government or push the public sector to be able to, to, to get the wins that they want um, and, and grow the economy as such. Linda, from your experience from the East Africa perspective, and we've got different countries of different levels of maturity in terms of organizing their private sector. Um, and I'm sure you've seen that in East Africa and you alluded to it in terms of that. How do we bring along, or how do we help those countries that have got, what well, if you want to call it, immature private sector in terms of their formation and how they're formed? And how do we bring them into a sort of a regional block perspective, and then how do we bring them into a continental, from a continental perspective? Thank you. I think one needs to show the opportunities, and these opportunities have to be common. I mean, if I'm a smaller economy, and we were the smaller economy, smaller economy if you compare to the rest of East Africa, um, specifically Kenya, Tanzania, we saw the opportunity there. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's just that. You have to, to see the opportunity. You have to present the opportunity and, and, and share it such that, you know, people are able to, to see that opportunity. So for us, openness, creating, you know, um, an open system was very key for us and um, we, you, can, you can now see the results because um, you know when we opened up our you know visa you, you, you know you, can, you arrive you get your visa upon arrival it, it opened up you know more opportunities there so people have to see that most of the smaller countries for instance in our region are landlocked as well so it's, for me, it was really a matter of identifying the opportunities and sharing those opportunities. So yesterday at the meeting, we discussed the fact that the key, the three areas that we felt that this Apex body should focus on was air connectivity, visas, and then marketing. From your perspective and all of your experience, I'm going to ask each of you, where should they start focusing and out of those three, or is there something else that this Apex body should focus on? So where's the priorities? Start. Okay. Um, this feels also a little bit like the TBCSA leadership conference we had. Um, I don't think that... So, I mean, it's two things, and I'm, I'm conscious that I'm saying this as a marketer. I think that if you don't remove the barriers, you might as well not spend the money on marketing. I think that's sort of point number one. Um, having said that... Certainly in the South African context, and I, would, I, would, I haven't seen the numbers, but I would assume the same would be true at continental level. Certainly at regional level, we see it in the numbers. Through the 18 months that we had travel bans with our international source markets, with the core markets in, in the northern hemisphere, we had a captive market on the continent. We had a captive market in South Africa. We have now got people that have found an, a, a new appreciation for the tourism destinations on their front door that they perhaps hadn't had before because they were able to do the Paris and the London and the New York and the whatever. Now they have actually discovered the beauty of their own country or the beauty of their own continent. And I think that there's a short window of opportunity that we've got now to try and encourage those tourists, that additional market that we've gained, to continue to travel locally and to continue to see their own country, their own continent as a destination of choice for a holiday. The second thing that I want to say, and links back to the barriers, the massive opportunity that we've got for the continent is that there are almost 200 international association events that travel the globe. The continent gets 10% of those 200 global events that happen every year. There's a massive opportunity for us if we can just remove the barriers and we can share leads with a, along the continent, we can actually have big conferences, substantially greater footprint on the African continent if we collaborate together and if we make it easier for people to get there. Thank you, thank you. 
Dr. Bao, you look ready. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to be, to be biased and say of the three, uh, the emphasis, uh, the first step, first emphasis should be on connectivity. If you, you work the visas and there's no visa problem, but the people can fly from one country to the other, then you haven't done anything. If we can market and market well, but you still have no connectivity, you really have still haven't done much. So they're all important, but I think, uh, uh, as I said, I'll be biased. Starting with connectivity would really be, be great. Uh, now, I do talk, we have forums where we talk with the different uh, director, general of, director generals of the different civil aviation authorities in the, in the continent, all 54 of them, uh, the people who run the airports. In the aviation community, we all agree that the solution has been put together many years ago, that four years ago, uh, Satam put together the steps as to what every country has been done. That we, for example, as the authorities, have been advising government all over the last four years that please do this. This is the next step that we need to do. And nothing is moving. So this is where we need uh, the private sector. Where we need, we feel like a lone voice. When we are trying to, what we are trying to accomplish is something good for everybody. But also what could be frustrating is that at least for the 35 countries that have signed SATAM, we all agree, the governments agree, that it is a good thing. But the execution is the problem. And we in the aviation community are the lone voice trying to say, please let us do something. And we need the help of everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Winnie. Thank you. Um, I was going to say that the, the, the critical thing for the apex body is that of access. And I'm not going to say access only from an air connectivity perspective. But access, visas are also a big issue on the continent. But even if we need to get visas, because I think um, past just people wanting to, to travel, there's also security concerns from the different countries that if the borders were porous, then we would be inviting other um, vices into the countries. Fine. If we need visas, let's leverage on technology for us to be able to apply for e-visas, uh, if possible. If you then need visas for certain countries, then let us have access to the visas. Um, we're trying to do a routing right now, and it's quite a nightmare to try and get uh, visas for certain countries on, on, on the continent uh, where they are not represented in your, in your country by an embassy. So access, be it digital access, um, connectivity, definitely. And I think marketing will be last. I think when we have those things in place, then it will be easier to market uh, the continent. Yeah. Linda, have they stolen your thunder? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, um, I'll go with Winnie. It's, uh, you know, visas. Um, when you open up your borders, it, it's quite easy for people to get into, the, you know, the country. Um, what we've done in Rwanda is we've opened up visas for all. Uh, for all Africans. Africans can travel and actually get, the, <laughs> get their visas upon arrival. And you pay nothing. Uh, it's free of charge. Uh, all Commonwealth uh, states can also ac access their visas upon entry, and it's also free of charge. All the Francophone states, um, same thing. Um, so it, for me, the critical, um, the critical thing is to really open up those borders for people to, to be able to move. And we've seen that it has worked in some regions. Yesterday we were talking about the Vanilla Islands. It has worked for them on the regional aspects, but also the international um, uh, you know, side of things. Um, so visa openness, and then the second one would be obviously um, air access, but also infrastructure development across borders so that you know people are able to cross even by other means of transport whether by you know road or water or rail it should be uh, you know um, easy for people to move thank you brilliant thank you so it sounds like this private sector body has got a lot of work cut out for it um, are there any questions from the floor I didn't mention at the start sorry that we've uh, we've had our time cut that's a, the disadvantage of being at the end of the day We've been told to make it short, 
So, and I've also been told two questions from the floor. Is there anything online? No. Any questions from the floor? I can see I'm going to go here first, and then I'm going to go that side. So here's a question. Is, is there a mic going, or do you need one of ours? Does it work? Yeah, good. I'm um, uh, Shakti Jan from the Smiling Coast, the Gambia. Um, I am, I'm wondering, because I mean, our situation in the Gambia is so unique. We depend entirely on the, well, not entirely, but 80% of our tourists come by package stores. And uh, we have this problem of high cost of aviation fuel, high cost of landing uh, fees, and that boils down to the operator who comes to the Gambia calculating each and every penny. I've not heard anybody talk about the inflation and the aviation cost of all these things, which are factors that are deterrent to people traveling by air. So if at all I can throw that to the floor or to the panelist to see if there is any advice or any answer that you can give towards uh, these areas of concern. Thank you. I, I'm not sure I understood you well, but if I did, what I would say is it seems like we are, I always come to the same answer. But when you increase, uh, when you liberalize the sky and you increase the frequency, the market always works itself out. The prices will go down and competition will take care of everything. That's my view. And I think there's empirical evidence elsewhere that when such happens, uh, the frequency will take care of the prices and a lot of things will come back to, to the right price. Sorry, you know, I, I would agree with, um, with the good doctor and say that um, in the absence of opening up the skies and in the absence of multiple frequencies or multiple players uh, in a market, you're always going to have uh, this kind of situation because the airport authorities or the fuel suppliers will have fixed costs that they must take care of. Um, and, uh, you know, the pricing is going to be based on that. What is the fixed cost plus? Um, so in the absence of lots of players in, 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 in that market, we're always going to find ourselves uh, in a situation where we overpriced. And this is happening across the continent. We haven't opened up the skies. We don't have the frequencies that we should have. Um, and if we had that and if we had more players, um, then uh, our pricing will certainly come down. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to agree with you, and I think that we tend, that this is a hard talk session, so I think we need to be realistic, that we have a lot of um, aviation entities on the continent who like their fees. <laughs> Um, and they're not thinking about the bigger economic picture and what the implications are. And this is, so this private sector body could possibly play a role in showing what difference it makes by reducing the fees. Um, now the question from the floor. Okay, I'm going to the back on the right hand side. And I think it's, I think it's Luke or somebody next to Luke there that's right at the back there. Is there a mic going somewhere? I think it's coming. Are you two going to arm wrestle? Because you've got uh, both of you've got your arms. Three of you've got your arms up. <laughs> okay, I think the lady with the lady in the yellow. Because, <laughs> thank you, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I am Susan Ngalo from Kenya Tourism Federation, and I have just to add to the voice of what is happening on the floor. I'd like to talk about the Northern Corridor and say it was a, a success because private sector and public sector came to sit together and we achieved the single tourist visa and other, even communication across the borders. And then I look at the Kenyan story. Each um, parastatal under the Ministry of Tourism, we have private sector participation and we when we are in there, we are able to articulate the issues that are affecting our members' businesses. Things immediately or almost immediately. Then on the airline, maybe the open skies is not the topic for today. Let's talk bilateral agreements. 
as we were told from the case of Vanilla Island. Thank you. Chime in a little bit about the open skies and giving a, every African airline all the freedoms from the first to the from the first to the fifth freedom rights are actual is actually one of the concrete measures of Saturn. So it's all encompassed in that. My question now, now and also the uh, bilateral agreements. Uh, we the one of the measures is for each country to make sure that all existing bilateral agreement bilateral air service agreements and the future ones are compliant with SATAM, because SATAM put measures as to this is what you need to do to make sure that our, our, your buses are in, in a better shape to encourage more connectivity, uh, more frequencies. So I don't think it's, it's something that can be separated. It's an aspect of SATAM. So the policies are in place. Yes. It's about getting our governments to actually imp to sign and then implement. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are we another For major? my question, can I come in? <laughs> yes. I just want to say that uh, if policies are in place and uh, the government is not following it, what we need to do is to have activists. Activism is what we need now to push the government to implement the SATAM. Without SATAM, tourism will not be effective in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to my esteemed panel, Monica, Linda, Winnie, Bao. Thank you for your time and for your valuable input and learnings. And let's make sure that this Pan-African Apex private sector body takes place and that we can actually start to make some meaningful changes to tourism, intra-Africa tourism travel. Thank you. Thank you very much to our esteemed panelists as well as our moderator, Leanne Back, I'd like to believe you would agree that that was a fantastic panel discussion. Very insightful. A round of applause for them once again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this was a hard talk session on intra-Africa travel and tourism revolution. Now, we completely understand that uh, this is a platform, uh, you know, that should allow for uh, consequential discussions that are very necessary. Uh, but unfortunately, at this point, we are running out of time as we have another uh, event scheduled for you, my distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this evening. And I'd like to believe you'll take advantage of that as well as a moment uh, to network and to engage, to interact, to ask questions, as well as to comment on all the presentations that happened here today. And you can even take it further to social media, you know, to just go uh, continue the conversation there. Right now, though, our last panel discussion for the day before now we reflect on the day with, Dr. Uh, with Mr. Miller Matola, I'd like to invite our moderator for this next session, which is an African case study for economic inclusivity. This this will be moderated by the Director of Communications, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and East African Cooperation from Tanzania, uh, Ms. Mindy Kasiga. May we please give her a round of applause as she makes it to the stage to give us our final panel discussion for the day.